good morning. Good morning. We're going to get started here. We have a lot of ground to cover today, and I know you're all excited about this wonderful event that's being put on. I'd like to first introduce myself. My name is Kevin Worley. I am the chair of the St. Louis County Workforce Investment Board. I've been a member of the board for 12 years. I'm also the director of operations for CBL and Associates Properties. They are the owners of the five big malls here in St. Louis. CBL controls retail in St. Louis. I would like to take a moment to thank our sponsors. Without them, this event would not be possible. U.S. Bank, Keosite, Rankin, MERS Goodwill, Missouri Rehabilitation Association, St. Louis Community College, Challenge Unlimited, SSM Health, Job News USA, Talify, Empower Now, and St. Louis Development Corporation. Just to note for a word on the housekeeping that if you need to use the restrooms as you exit, they're to your right down the hallway on your left. If you need help with anything, please look for one of the volunteers with the red or yellow lanyards on. If you want water or something to drink, vending machines are on the lower level, the stairs or the elevator to your right as you exit the room. It is my honor to introduce to you the St. Louis County Executive, the Honorable Mr. Steve Stinger, who will be giving the opening remarks today. Mr. Stinger was sworn in on January 1st, 2015, as the 8th St. Louis County Executive. Previously, Mr. Stinger represented the 6th the District on the St. Louis County Council for two terms. The county executive worked as a CPA and an attorney for Ernst & Young before starting his own law firm in 1999. Mr. Stinger is a proud graduate of the University of Missouri-St. Louis and St. Louis University School of Law. Mr. Stinger and his wife, Allie, have two children, a daughter, Madeline, age two, and a son, Lincoln, seven months. It is my great pleasure to turn it over to the Honorable Mr. Stephen Stinger. Kevin, thank you for those kind remarks and thank you for all you do. Um, I want to welcome everyone to the second annual Accommodation for Success program. And it is truly an honor to be here and a real pleasure. Uh, St. Louis County government is proud to partner with MERS Goodwill, Vocational Rehabilitation, Paraquad, Rehab Services for the Blind and others in providing this opportunity. And this partnership has helped the county improve its services to persons with disabilities, including ongoing training to our American Job Center staff in their work with the disabled. And I want to express extend a special thanks to the businesses participating in this program. Those of you who attended last year's inaugural event know how popular and helpful it was. It exceeded our expectations, drawing more than 100 registrants and dozens of businesses. You will have the chance to hear from businesses and employees about the transformative benefits of hiring people with disabilities. In addition, we have expanded our program to include a job fair on the second day of this event at which people with disabilities can network with local employers. While federal law pertaining to hiring requires companies to give equal opportunities to persons with disabilities, significant imbalances remain. In fact, the employment rate for people with disabilities is only about 20%, and that can be improved dramatically. And that is what this event is about helping to raise that hiring rate. Again, I thank you all for joining us this morning and for making your personal commitment to this very important issue. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Stinger, for those kind, warm remarks, and we honor your commitment to St. Louis County, as well as the time you sacrificed to be here with us today. I'd like to take a moment now to recognize our honored guest, Yvonne Wright, Director of Workforce Development for Missouri Vocational Rehabilitation, Dwayne Schemack, Director of Youth Transition and Employment for Missouri Department of Mental Health, Division of Developmental Disabilities, Mr. Michael Holmes, Executive Director of the Slate American Job Center, St. Louis City, Ms. Andrea Jackson Jennings, Director of St. Louis County, Department of Human Services, David E. Stockland, Executive Director, Madison County, Illinois Employment and Training, Michael Ravenscraft, Director, Jefferson Franklin Consortium, One Stop Coordinator, Missouri Job Center of Jefferson County, and Scott J. Dracknick, Director, St. Charles County Department of Workforce and Business Development, Executive Director, Missouri Job Center of St. Charles County. I'd like to now introduce our keynote speaker, Andrew Santorius. Andrew is currently a trial lawyer with the State of Missouri Public Defender's Office. He obtained his undergraduate degree from Rockhurst University and then went on to obtain his graduate degree and law degree from the University of Missouri, Kansas City. He is a proud alumnus of the Starkloff Disability Institute. I'd like to welcome Mr. Centaurus. Good morning, everybody. First off, uh, can everybody hear me all right? If anybody can't, please yell at me. Um, I won't see your hands or anything, so. <laughs> so whenever I start something like this, whether it's speaking to a group such as this or uh, standing in front of a panel of jurors, getting ready to select them, there's a certain amount of fear that is always associated with that. And I find it's easiest if I just share that with you, if I just confess to you that I am afraid. And the reason I'm afraid is because I'm different. Now, growing up, I never was different. Um, growing up, I was just Andrew. And although people would stop me in the grocery store and say, hey, why is your hair so white? Or why are you holding that so close to your face? I always had the responses my parents taught me. Well, that's just the way God made me. Or then later on when I got older, well, I have a condition called albinism. Finally, I, I learned all about it, and I can explain to you for hours about the genetics. But basically, here's everything you need to know about me in a nutshell as it pertains to albinism. I have a condition called oculocutaneous albinism. It's a big fancy word that essentially means I don't see too well, but I get some really cool hair in exchange. <laughs> now, both my parents are carriers of this, which means they don't have it. So it was a little bit of a shock when Andrew pops out and has white hair. And again, as I said growing up, I was never different. I never saw myself as having a disability. Um, I just went through and did the same things everybody else did up until that one point in PE when we started throwing balls around and they don't really react too well if you can't see them coming. Uh, but basically what I want to do is take just a second to explain what I see. Because when people hear the term legally blind, they make an assumption. They think, so he can't see us at all. And for those of you in the back, that probably is true. But um, I can see you. Essentially, here's the way it works. My visual acuity is 2,400. This means I can see at 20 feet what most people see at 400 feet away. So if we're driving down the highway and we're in that car 
and there's a sign that's 400 feet away. There's that magic point that, oh, I can read that that says next exit, St. Louis Community College. For me to see that sign just as clearly, I have to be 20 feet away. So I can make out faces, I can see colors, um, I can read signs, I just have to get a lot closer. Now, this becomes somewhat humorous at times. I had a client who I went down to the jail to meet several weeks ago, and we get into the holding cell, and I sit down and I introduce myself. I'm Andrew Sartorius, I'll be representing you. And he says, hey, are you the dude that sniffs paper? <laughs> I can understand his confusion. <laughs> I politely explained that, no, that's just how I read. <laughs> and I think it's really important to have that kind of sense of humor about disabilities, both as a person with a disability and when it comes to people who are interacting with people with disabilities. There are going to be things I don't see. There are going to be times that I run into the glass door that has no markings. We laugh about those things. But it's not always funny. There are times that it is substantially more difficult. And that's where this fear comes from. And I'd like to share one of the stories that's the basis of where my fear comes from with you guys. When I was in high school, uh, I had a group of friends and I hung out with them. Every morning when I got off the bus, it was, I ran up to their lockers and we'd hang out until it was far too late to get to class on time and scurry to wherever we were supposed to go. And we planned on doing things together and would hang out after school occasionally. And one day, I was at the movies with my family. I have a really large family. There are nine of us now. My parents just uh, adopted some foster kids, so not all of us were growing up at the same time. Don't worry. My dad is crazy. He's right over there. You can meet him later. <laughs> um, but we were at the movies with my entire group of family members, and my sister told me afterwards, Andrew, don't you hang out with these people? Yes, I do. Well, they were staying on the other side of the lobby laughing at you. And of course, I thought it was my sister trying to cause a fight or something. So I said, yeah, whatever, Emily, you're wrong. <laughs> Until several weeks later, I was at, high, I was at school um, walking around after classes. And I was walking down the hall. And I came up to some of the lovely old school fire doors, the kind that are held open with a magnet and they form a triangle behind them. So long as the power doesn't go out and then they close. And as I'm walking down the hall, I hear snickers, you know, <laughs> coming from behind that fire door. And I hear, he can't see us. And what people, I think, generally fail to realize about me is that my vision is terrible, but my hearing is phenomenal. <laughs> and I tell who people are by their voices. <laughs> I can't see faces all that well, so hearing is how I do that. And I recognized it as that group of friends I used to hang out with. And it was years later that I was able to kind of understand why this hurt me so much. Um, it was at Trial Lawyers College, and a guy named Joey Lowe, um, who's an awesome trial attorney, but just kept grilling me about this, trying to break me down and be like, why? Why do you feel this way? Why do you feel this way? And I was staying in front of this group crying, you know, some 10 years later, finally being able to put into words just what this felt like. And, and the mo biggest way I can sum it up is like this. I feel like I have a lot to offer. I feel like I'm a good friend. 
I'm going to be there for them. And when something like this happens, you feel rejected. But not rejected because somebody has made some kind of judgment of you. They have weighed you up, weigh, uh, sized you up and found you unworthy. Not some kind of conviction where the evidence has all been examined, but a much more visceral response. You're rejected just because of your rapper, the way you look or the way you act. And when I began the employment search, it was kind of the same thing. Um, when I began hunting for jobs, I put out about 200 applications. Now, this is not all the fault of my disability because the job market was absolutely terrible. How many people remember that? Um, but I couldn't help but feel like I was being judged because of what I looked like or what I could or could not see. And just a minute, I have to snip this paper. <laughs> and I realized that that job hunt was exactly like how I felt dealing with those girls. And it was almost as though I didn't want to open up anymore. I didn't want to try and share my gifts that I feel like I've developed because I was afraid of those being rejected. I was afraid of going through that exact same experience. But eventually I realized through luck, I would, I would guess, that I can't act that way. And I'd like to share with you a, a quote I found in thinking about this um, that I think really sums up the, the change that I had to go through in my life. It's a quote by Helen Keller, and for those of you like me who cannot read it on the screen, it reads, avoiding drama is no safer in the long run than outright exposure. The fearful are caught just as often as the bold. Now I have the opportunity to speak with groups of people with disabilities frequently. This is, in fact, a very novel experience for me. I'm not used to talking to the employers. I'm used to talking to the employees. But I'd like to share with you what I talk to the employees about. When I talk to people with disabilities, let me uh, interrupt real fast and say, don't worry, my story is awesome. There's happy endings at the end, but we're going to go on a journey to get there. So sorry to bring you all down to start with. But <laughs> But we'll go up. Don't worry. Um, so when I speak with, to groups of people with disabilities, this is the mentality I have in mind. This is what I want them to take away with it, that they need to be bold. They need to go out there and seize the bull by the horns, seize the day, carpe diem, whatever expression you want to use. This is the mentality I want them walking away with. Frankly, it's the best mentality because, and, and as I said, I didn't think about this until then, but Helen Keller was exactly right. Hiding gets you nowhere. You're still just as likely to get caught. But other than that, the mentality I really want them to walk away with is that people with disabilities have to meet the world halfway. What I mean by this is that there's two groups, I think, of people with disabilities, and, it, and I know that's not fair because it's a spectrum and everybody falls on different levels, but in effect, you have people that want the world to adapt to them, the people who go through life saying, well, I can't see, somebody needs to read that to me. Well, I can't see, so somebody needs to drive me here, and I can't take public transportation because I can't see. And then you have the people that go the other extreme, and they try and do as much as they can to accommodate themselves. They get adaptive technology. They work with people to accommodate their needs. Do whatever they can with what they've got 
so that they've exhausted their options, they can say to someone, look at everything I've done. I need help with just this little piece. Could you please help me? And it works a lot better, I find. So, this kind of goes into the fact that I think people with disabilities need to hold themselves to a high standard. For far too long in our country, and I would suspect around the world, but I'm not positive, for far too long in our country, it's kind of been a system of making excuses. Well, we don't expect too much out of him because he can't see. Well, we don't expect too much out of this person because they don't read well. And I don't think that's acceptable. I think we've always got to be pushing ourselves, always got to be moving forward. And the last thing I always talk about with people with disabilities when I talk to them is that they have to be upfront. We don't get anywhere by hiding. It's so much easier if I walk up to someone and say, I'm Andrew, I'm legally blind. It's scary, as I talked about in the beginning. But if they're going to reject me, they're going to reject me. And I'd rather that happen in the beginning than at the end. At the end of the day, all of this is still terrifying. And while that's not something I talk to most people about, it is true. Me for just a second. And it occurs to me that as terrifying as it is for a person with a disability, it's got to be equally as terrifying for you employers. How many people have seen the movie Forrest Gump? Unfortunately, life is not exactly like a box of chocolate. <laughs> not everything in there is sweet. And I can envision that as an employer, when I was selecting somebody, I'd have a lot of fear about drawing something that just didn't taste good. What it comes down to is that when I put out all those applications, in my heart, I realized that there were legitimate concerns with hiring a person with a disability. In fact, I realized this years ago. I wanted to be a doctor originally. I was pre-med. Um, and then one day I thought to myself, what's my patient going to think when I walk into their room with a giant magnifying glass and say, all right, I'm going to stitch up your arm now? I wouldn't like that very much. <laughs> So I thought, maybe we need to consider a different route. I went to law school. I never looked back. Apparently, I love talking, so that makes it easy. But you know, there is that fear. And that's a legitimate fear. It's a legitimate concern. Even though I try my very best to make light of the situation, it's not something I can laugh away for you guys. But I didn't really understand what those fears were. I can identify where my fear comes from. I can use that to become stronger. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But in effect, I can own it. And it's not something that controls me. But for you guys, for you employers out there who are getting ready to meet people with disabilities and potentially make a decision, should we hire them? What are those fears? So I did some research. Lawyers are very good at research. And I found articles that identified seven fears. The first one is that there's a legitimate fear out there that people with disabilities lack the necessary knowledge, skills, abilities, and other miscellaneous requirements of a job. And this doesn't just come in the form of formal education. This comes in the form of 
socialization or on-the-job experience. Things that do not necessarily come simply from a classroom. And this is a legitimate concern because studies have shown that people with disabilities across the board are typically receiving less education than their non-disabled counterparts. Another concern is that people with disabilities will be less productive. And I think that this comes from the fact that our system sort of treats people like cogs. And I know that saying that to employers is not something you guys want to hear, but it's kind of true. When you have an accountant, you expect that accountant to do a specific job. And should something happen to that accountant, I don't know, maybe they get eaten by a shark. Um, you want another accountant to be able to step in and do that exact same job. And the idea that someone might not be able to do the exact same job, someone might be different, is scary. It doesn't work with our industrial model of how things should work. And stereotypes and biases are a big one. Stereotypes and biases are things that we're basically taught to believe. They don't come from experience typically. And, and when we're talking about stereotypes and biases, I want to be very clear about this. We're not talking about saying, Andrew wouldn't be a good surgeon because he can't see. That's a fact. Um, we're talking about no person with albinism would be a good surgeon because none of them can see. Sweeping generalizations that apply to an entire class. We typically think about this in terms of race, gender, but we don't often think about the preconceptions we hold when it comes to disabilities. But that's a real obstacle that people with disabilities face when employers are deciding to hire them. Lawsuits and other legal stuff. So, everybody knows, they fear me, to please don't, but they fear lawyers. Nobody wants to deal with that lawsuit. And it's a very scary thing because when it comes down to it, there are several opportunities that a company could get sued. They can get sued for failing to hire somebody, for failing to not fire somebody, for failing to accommodate somebody. There are lots of reasons why lawsuits happen, um, but we'll talk about why you don't have to worry about them so much in a minute. But the other big cost that companies are afraid of are accommodations. It does cost money sometimes to have a person with a disability but again, we'll talk about how you can mitigate that cost and really why it's not as big of a concern in just a moment. Next, co companies are afraid that coworkers can react badly. And the research I've read have identified three areas where companies fear, that, that companies are afraid of. First, they're afraid that coworkers are going to be angry that now, because you have a person that's receiving accommodations, somehow they're going, to require, they're going to be required to perform additional work. Or they're not going to be able to be as productive, thus making less money, because they're hindered by this person with a disability. The second area is that lots of times people are frustrated with accommodations. In fact, I have a coworker for the longest time that resented me quite a bit because when I uh, obtained my current job, they had just gone through a massive upheaval and they had to move people around from county to county. My office covers three counties. Um, Cole County, which is Jefferson City, is amazing. We have great judges. The jail, the courthouse, our office are all on one block. I get to walk to work, I get to walk home from work. Miller County, on the other hand, is one of our counties that we cover. It's down by the Lake of the Ozarks. It's not so nice. 
Um, and one of my coworkers, before I was even hired, I'll note, but one of my coworkers was told that he would now have to cover Miller County. And for the longest time, he blamed me. Um, he's a really nice guy, but he had that bias because he perceived me as forcing him to have to now make the half hour commute to and from the courthouse down there. And the last major concern that employers have about their coworkers is that they'll simply be uncomfortable with people with disabilities. They won't know what to say or how to act. Another concern is that customers will react badly and effectively for the same reasons, but mostly that they're gonna be uncomfortable. And the last reason is that employers are concerned that there aren't enough economic incentives. They're gonna to have to shell out a little bit more money and they're not gonna be able to recoup that. And I will confess, in my research, I was not able to find some master list of all of the different programs that are out there to encourage people to hire people with disabilities. But that's why conferences like this are so phenomenal. And I'll talk just a little bit about areas that um, money can be recouped from, but I expect that you'll get a lot more of that information later on today. So now I'd like to go through and talk to you about why these are things we don't really need to be so afraid of. First, people with disabilities not lack the knowledge, skills, abilities, and other requirements. So, interestingly enough, education has become more and more accessible over the years. I am extremely fortunate. When I began the whole educational journey, in my mind, I was the only person in the world with albinism because I was definitely the only one at my school. And the, there were extremely nice vision itinerates, um, vision teachers, and they'd come in with their box of goodies. I didn't even, I didn't understand what they were doing but they had these boxes that were just full of all kinds of different magnifying glasses and different colored lenses. And it was pretty much like, how should we experiment on Andrew today? <laughs> what I realized now, years later, is that they, were, they were literally were experimenting on me because it's not very common to have, well, let me, let me back up just a little bit and re rephrase that. At the time I started going through school, it wasn't very common to have a person with a visual impairment that was not completely blind and that was going through mainstream courses. And so they didn't really know what to do. Now, as I said earlier, my sister, um, well, I said I have many siblings. One of my sisters has albinism too. Her name is Madeline. And when Madeline started going through school some 10 years later, maybe, things had changed quite a bit. And now they kind of knew what to do. So waiting in the office every single day for an average of maybe half an hour to an hour was replaced with a magnifying glass because apparently making copies that are that big um, on 11 by 17 paper, not so convenient, kind of difficult. People can still use that, of course. I don't really know what everybody's using now. So if that's your thing, stick with it. Um, but all of a sudden, more doors were opened. And then educational institutions started to realize this is a major group of people that are able to do the work that we're not tapping into. So lots of programs have been established. The last speech I gave was to a group of high school students in Kansas City that were part of a transitions program. And this was fantastic because what they did is they took a group of people with learning disabilities and they brought them onto a college campus and they gave them during the summer 
a taste of what college life would be like. And they worked on organizational skills and things like that as they lived in a dorm. And these kids kind of got the opportunity to assess, is college right for me? At the end, um, UMKC agreed to waive their um, application fee for anybody who wanted to apply. It was an awesome program, and more and more programs like that are springing up. And also, once you get into the universities, access offices are becoming better and better. They have more resources. They know more things that they can do. And they're much more willing to work with people with disabilities than even a short time ago. In fact, when I started at Rockhurst, the access office was one woman, a very nice woman. Her name is Sandy Waddell. She's still there, I'm pretty sure. Except she had to do like 15 different things. She was in charge of this program and that program, and worrying about people with disabilities was way down on her plate. And since even I started the educational process, um, more and more staff have been dedicated to that particular program to make sure that people with disabilities have what they need. So education is becoming more accessible, but the biggest problem that people with disabilities have, I think, I think is learning how to present that. And guess what? There is absolutely nothing that you guys as employers can really do to teach somebody how to present their information to you. Because when you get the information, you're looking at a resume or a cover letter, and it's kind of too late at that point. And this is, I think, the problem I ran into when I sent out those hundreds of resumes. My resume was terrible. Somebody's laughing. I, you probably read one of my resumes. <laughs> no, it was, it was absolutely terrible. And I didn't put in there what employers were looking for. Because nobody told me what I needed to put in there. So when it came down to it, I kind of put things down that were important to me. And I, I think I'm smart, so it wasn't terrible. But what was important to me isn't what you guys as employers are looking for. The other big thing is this phenomenal thing that many people think is torture. I personally love it. Known as behavioral-based interviewing. How many people do behavioral-based interviewing in here? I can't see hands, so you're going to have to like clap or something if you do. So I love it. I agree with all of the research behind it. I think this is the best way that you can assess a candidate's ability to perform a specific job. But when you walk in and say, tell me about a time that you had to solve a complex problem, <laughs> people aren't prepared for that. Nobody sits there typically with their friends over a beer saying, so remember that one complex problem I had to solve last week? <laughs> yeah, but you need to make sure and have your star story ready <laughs> just in case. So for people with disabilities, luckily you have awesome programs like the Starcloft Institute, and I've got to give them a shout out. I don't know, do we have anybody from Starcloft here? No? So in particular, you people who work with uh, vocational rehabilita re rehabilitation services and rehabilitation services for the blind, Send your people there. It's phenomenal. I can't speak highly enough for it because all of a sudden these things that don't come naturally are the things we're talking about. How do we present ourselves in a way that employers can really interact with us? How can they know who we are? How can we get them beyond that wrapper on the outside and start to see who Andrew is on the inside? So luckily, we have programs like that that are working on it. As I said, there's not much you guys can do as employers, but maybe if somebody doesn't answer that question quite right, you can help lead them a little bit. Maybe.
most importantly, what I want to get across with this section is that people with disabilities who are highly qualified are out there. They're, and I'm not saying they're enough to go around, especially with new regulations and everything. We'll talk about the regulations in a little bit, but they are out there. And I think that opportunities like this are phenomenal because you guys are going to get an opportunity to network and find those people that will fit your needs. To the fact that people with disabilities are very excited to have the opportunity to show you what they can do. Um, I feel as though I'm very loyal and I very much recognize the fact that somebody took a chance on me. Somebody bit into that thing they pulled out of a chocolate box not knowing what it was going to be, and I want to make sure that I do everything in my power to make sure it was a good experience. So I think that people with disabilities um, are definitely not going to decrease productivity. And in fact, with all the advent of modern technology, many things that used to be barriers are just disappearing. In one of the articles I was reading in preparation for this, an employer was quoted on saying it doesn't matter if someone's in a wheelchair if their job is to answer phones. Somebody else said, you can't really worry about the hearing aid if the person's job is to work on spreadsheets. With all the technology we're using today, so much of the productivity loss that might have occurred, say, 40 years ago because of a disability just disappears. Um, a couple of things I forgot to say about that facility. The, the um, study went on to talk about how um, people called in sick significantly less in that ever dreaded employee turnover was reduced because employee retention was reaching record levels. Um, not just of the people with disabilities, but also of the rest of the workforce. Now, stereotypes and biases. The fact of the matter is that we are born, we aren't, we aren't born, but are, we are raised with stereotypes and biases based on our environment. If I were to ask you guys how many people in here have some sort of bias. I'd expect everybody to eventually say they do. And, and the way I typically deal with this when I'm talking to a jury is with respect to race. And it's interesting because we don't realize that each one of us is just a little bit racist or just a little bit biased. And there's not really a way for us to purge that from our system. The important thing we can do is recognize it and try and not make decisions based on that bias. And as just a little example, we can talk about bias in terms of gender. We'll play a little game. I'll say a job. And you guys, in your mind, think about the first thing, gender-wise, that pops into your head. And the interesting thing about this is that the bias doesn't necessarily just have to be about the person. It can also be about the job. If I say fireman, you guys are probably all thinking men. If I say policeman, same thing. Nurse, woman, teacher typically also a woman. And we find this um, very pertinent to me doing criminal defense. We find this latent bias very prominently when it comes to eyewitness identification. And everybody's heard some very crude person say something along the lines of all Asians look alike or something like that. And the fact of the matter is that new neurological studies are showing that that is more true than people realize. And what it is, it's not that all people of a given race look alike. 
It's that when you're raised in an environment, your brain begins to pick up differences based on, within the environment you're raised. And so if you're exposed then to a new environment, it's difficult for you to identify the differences in that new group. And so when this comes to play with eyewitness identification is that studies have found that cross-racial identification is extremely unreliable, yet we allow it all the time. And I share this with you because it's something that we're not aware of. When, somebody, when an eyewitness identifies someone as the perpetrator of a crime, they are 100% certain that's the person who did it. And no one is going to tell them otherwise. And they, they don't have the ability to say, maybe it was difficult for me to identify that person. What we need to do when we're looking for employees is think, what obstacles do I have? What barriers have I put up in my heart? And how can I get around those? This is the section that really is focused on you guys as employers. Because when it came to the skills, that's something people with disabilities need to work on better, uh, work on getting better at presenting. But when it comes to this, the biases and the stereotypes that's something that no one can overcome for you. You've got to be the ones to address those. Now, real quick to illustrate this, I want to share a quick picture with you. Um, I'm going to show you a group of my friends. And yes, they're my friends, because the common question I get is, are you all related? And for anybody who can't see this too well, it's a picture of um, myself. My wife is in there somewhere, and a bunch of other people with albinism. So let's talk a little bit about the dreaded lawsuit. The fact of the matter is that something like 95% of lawsuits are either dismissed or settled in favor of the defendant. 95%, first off, that doesn't bode well for me as a lawyer, but um, it does bode very well for you. In effect, the, chances, the risk you're taking isn't that huge. Of those lawsuits that result in a plaintiff verdict or a settlement for the plaintiff, most of those do not come from the hiring process. Most of those do not come from the accommodation process. Most lawsuits seem to come from the termination process. And what um, some focus groups have said is that, does this mean we're stuck with a person with a disability who's underperforming forever? And I don't think so. Because as long as you're making good decisions about what to do, and you're not reacting, you're going to make the right call. Um, my advice to everybody is document. Documentation is key. This will keep you from getting sued. But most importantly, you're not taking a big risk. Because when I hear about a case that results in a settlement or results in a jury verdict, it's not people who made a mistake. It's not people who are trying to do the right thing and coming to seminars like this and they simply accidentally had something go wrong. It's people that show a pattern of discrimination. It's people that should have something to worry about. And as evident by the fact that all of you are sitting here today listening to me talk, I don't think any of you fit into that boat. You should have no fear about litigation. But accommodations, that's something that could cost a lot of money, right? You'd be surprised. Because it turns out that in recent studies, they've found that over 50% of the workplace accommodations requested result in zero cost. Something like, hey, do you mind if I take a break when my hands get tired? Isn't going to cost the employer anything. Now, 
of the remaining costs, most of them typically fall below $5,000. There's a very small percentage that go above $5,000. We'll talk about why even those shouldn't be something to be feared when we talk about the financial incentives. But accommodations, like, as I said, typically do not end up costing you anything. Because when you also factor in awesome programs like, and here's another shout out to my friends at Rehab Services for the Blind, Invoke Rehab, the state provides technology. The resources I'm using in my job so it's going to be kind of confusing because the state of Missouri employs me now. But the public defender did not have to pay for. That didn't come out of their revenue or anything like that because I had it from college. And that which I didn't have, Zoom text, um, rehab services provided. And they're a resource they are provided to help people get gainful employment. And they can help you guys too. Oh, the last thing I want to note is that in determining what's a reasonable accommodation, if you're afraid of getting sued about that, um, in reviewing some of the case law, courts give extreme deference to the employer, meaning that if you guys say, no, that's not reasonable, um, they're probably going to side with you. And, and when I say that is, I have a CCTV, um, and of course that's reasonable. We can just objectively say that. It's, it's something I need to do the job, and so it is reasonable, especially because I provided it myself. Now, if I went to the employer and said, look, Rolls-Royce just came out with this CCTV and I want it, <laughs> probably not so reasonable. <laughs> so in determining the accommodation, I think the case law is talking about the class of accommodation, not the kind. So do accommodate but you don't have to go for the very, very best thing. Well, that's a problem. There we go. So the other thing is that customers may react poorly. Oh, I'm sorry. Coworkers may react poorly. But I want you guys to remember back just a few minutes to that video. It was a long time ago. But remember how happy that woman was to come into work every day? I think that hiring people, I, I think that we don't put enough emphasis on hiring people who are excited to do the work, who are going to love what they do. And I think that when you give people with a disability an opportunity, their love for what they're doing is going to be infectious. The same with when we're talking about customers. Now, one thing I'll note is that there is absolutely no evidence to support, absolutely no um, studies, scientific evidence, to support that coworkers or customers react any differently to people with disabilities. We all have stories, like my story about my coworker, but they're easily addressed with a, hey, let's chat about this sort of conversation. Lack of incentives. Guys, I can't even begin to go into this because there are so many things out there. There are tax credits for this and tax credits for that. And if there are any lawyers in here who have ever heard about Circular 230, um, you know that I can't talk about them. Basically, the IRS says that I'm liable if I give any tax advice, so I don't talk about taxes, ever. Sorry. <laughs> um, but there are tons of incentives out there. But there's also programs um, through different organizations and things that will help offset the cost of any accommodations you have to pay. Um, in particular, there are programs out there, um, not talking about taxes, that will allow you to get refunds for any accommodations you have to put in. But also, you have a major incentive to hire people with disabilities because I'm not sure how all of this works, but there are many places and many different times that you'll bid for something that you're given a huge let leg up if you have a disabled workforce. And there, of course, are the new regulations enacting Section 504. Um, it was on the 
top of the list of things, the 7% that everybody's going to have to start worrying about. And as I said, there are people out there who are qualified, and what better incentive is there than keeping the government happy? Because we all know we need to keep the government happy. So the, the point about all of this is that disability does not mean broken. There are tons of people out there who are dying to live productive lives, who want nothing more than to be able to provide some for their family. Disability simply means unique. And in a world that is always changing, where innovation is so important, if you keep using the same cogs, you're never going to have that innovation. You're never going to have that change. For me, I'm very able to speak for my clients in court. I can make their stories come to life. But it's because of experiences like the ones I described earlier today. It's because of the times that I've been hurt, that I felt that injustice, that I'm able to turn it around and use it as power to advocate for my clients. When I go in the courtroom, and at this moment, and I'm sorry if there are any law enforcement in here, Cole County is not as good as St. Louis. Shh. Um, but, but when I am advocating for a client whose rights have just been trampled on, I don't have that experience. I don't feel the injustice from that. I feel the injustice from those snickering girls. And that's what gives me the power to stand in front of a jury and tell them I hope convincingly that this is wrong and it's up to them to fix it. An opportunity is all that people with disabilities need. And I'll explain to you why. When I, when I was sending out all those resumes, months had gone by and I called the career services department at UMKC and I talked with a woman who I, I hope is no longer there, and I also hope is not in this room. <laughs> and I said, how do I go about getting a job? Because I've sent out all these resumes, and you've reviewed it, and you said it's OK. It was not OK. This is before I got the real help. Um, and you say it's OK and everything, and I'm still not getting any interviews. And, and she says to me, well, Andrew, you need experience. And I say, absolutely, I agree with you. How do I get experience? Well, Andrew, you get a job. OK, fine. How do I get a job? Well, you need experience. And I'm like, OK, we can keep going around in a circle like this, but you just tell me what I need to do. Um, the fact of the matter is that I just needed a chance to prove myself. and. I'm very thankful for the public defender. I interviewed with them. Um, and I, I interviewed at, I think, three locations. And I, I got multiple offers for multiple offices. Um, of course, only one takes priority, so the other is lost out. Sorry. But magical things happen when you give people with disabilities that opportunity. First, the barriers start to break down. People in my office didn't know what albinism was. I had one co-worker, I have one coworker, one of our legal assistants who um, is African-American and she said to me, I thought albinos had to be black. <laughs> well, um, so African-Americans with albinism. And, um, you know, she, she said, I, I've, I have cousins with albinism, but I've never seen a white person with albinism before. And all of a sudden, we have these interactions where things are different. My coworkers and I joke around about my vision all the time, but it's something where I think they can become more accepting of all people with disabilities. My clients definitely, although they get scared that I'm sniffing paper, <laughs> I, I think in the end appreciate the unique abilities I bring to the system. But, and, and while I've had the opportunity, I've had so many wonderful opportunities from the public defender. Um, I've gotten to try a lot of cases. 
Um, I've represented over 500 clients. These are things that are going on my newly updated resume. <laughs> the good version. But at the end of the day, um, I, I am going to move on. But what was so interesting about this is when I was made the job offer that I'm going to be moving into in, in a week or two, um, having a disability wasn't a thing. He never talked to me about that. He talked to me about how he loves my ability to try a case and about how I did such a phenomenal job on this trial. And he wants me to be in his firm to be creative. And as we were sitting, we have our meetings at the diner in Jefferson City. As we were sitting at the diner over a cup of coffee last week, he said to me, well, Andrew, uh, I suppose you're going to do things a little bit differently, aren't you? I guess maybe I should think about that, shouldn't I? It was a complete afterthought. The plans have been laid for a month. We have a start date. And my disability never factored into it at all. I was finally free of it. And I think, realistically, it's because he had the opportunity to see me. And he got to see beyond the rapper. He got to see the real Andrew, because he got to see me work. Um, and thank God, because it's, it's the public defender that gave me a chance. Now, ladies and gentlemen, what I want to leave you with is that ultimately you have the power. And the reason I say you have the power, I'm sure many of you in here already employ people with disabilities, um, but it's companies like yours that are going to be paving the way such as what we saw with Walmart, I'm sorry, Walgreens. When you guys lead by example, you're gonna change the world. Because your workforce of unique people is gonna be better able to innovate, more accustomed to accomplishing, more accustomed to overcoming challenges, and in the end will give you a distinct advantage an advantage that other people will be envious of. So go out there and be bold. Because hiding is going to get you caught just as often as if you're not. I'd like to thank you guys very much for the opportunity to speak with you. I hope you guys have a phenomenal um, conference and as long as there's time, I'm not sure about the timing here, but as long as there ti is time, I'd like to open it up for any questions you guys might have. And I'm not going to see hands, so you're just going to have to yell at me. I've been with the state for two years, um, which is kind of a testament to our crushing caseload. If any Buddy has seen that in the newspaper. Um, we're handling way more cases than we should be, but I have been working with the state for two years. So the question is, did I have a good idea of the accommodations um, I required in kind of the delegation of responsibility there. Is that correct? Um, in effect, when it came down to it, what I talked about earlier, I, I really practice. Um, I feel it's my job to try and accommodate for myself as much as possible. Um, I want, and, and this is also a preference thing. For me, the hardest thing isn't whether or not I can get the job done at work. I'll find a way there. For me, the hardest thing is like, let's say I go to McDonald's after this and I want to order something off the menu. How am I going to do that? Because McDonald's might not have something I can use. Or I come here to speak, what am I going to do? Because I know the university isn't going to have Zoom text on the computer. And I don't expect them to. Um, so what I like is universal accommodations, things that I can have with me at any time that I can use in any situation. So when it came down to it, 
I really saw it as my responsibility to accommodate for myself. And I understood that if I needed something, so I do use a CCTV when I'm reading large motions and things, that's what I use. And should that break or something, it's the one I had from law school, but should that break or something, the system I know would provide another one. But um, as, far as, it, as far as I'm concerned, I think I need to do as much as I can on my own. Does that answer your question? Absolutely. So the question is, um, what can employers do in a corporate setting to see beyond disabilities? Is that correct? Right, right. You know, what I'd encourage you to do um, is get involved with different organizations out there that are helping people with disabilities, such as the Starkloft Institute. And the reason I, I recommend this is because when I was going through the Starkloft program, we had the opportunity to interview with um, several large companies. And one in particular was Nestle Purina. And I remember how the recruiters seemed so generally interested in what it was like to have a disability. And now this was a mock interview, um, but them getting to interview us kind of helped break down those barriers and kind of realize, wait, these are people that are really interesting. Maybe we wouldn't have considered them before. But I think the, the biggest way to break down those barriers, and this is gonna sound um, like I'm that career services woman, <laughs> but, but the easiest way to break down barriers is to have people with disabilities that are um, comfortable enough talking about it and working for your company. And, and the reason being that it's kind of an example sort of thing. Um, I don't know that, when I talked about my coworkers, I don't know that um, they would have been so accepting if I wasn't so accepting and I wasn't sharing that with them. No one wants to go last? <laughs> nice. Well, thank you guys very much. Give it a